welcome to the this morning's uh, webinar on fintech in ESG. My name is James DiBiazio. I am from the uh, Fintech Association of Hong Kong. Uh, I've been helping coordinate uh, an entire series of events that we're looking at the role of fintech playing in helping develop ESG uh, solutions and capabilities for the asset management and financial services industries here in Hong Kong and in Asia. So uh, this is an ongoing series of webinars and we're going to be putting together a, uh, a white paper at the end of it for the association. And we'll have one more uh, event this year looking at uh, digitization in, in the green bond space. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, I'm going to leave it now to introduce uh, today's panel will be moderated by Anastasia Nijagorocheva. She is from Ironfly Technologies and is my colleague at the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. Uh, so Anastasia, over to you and thanks for joining. Thanks, James. Thanks for attempting to pronounce my long last name. That's always a very fun exercise for everyone. Uh, so thanks everyone to jo for joining us today. And some of you are joining from Hong Kong. Some of you are joining all the way from the US. Um, very appreciate your time uh, very much. And then uh, I'm very excited to moderate this panel because here um, at Ironfly Technologies, we're actually working closely with how data is presented to traders at hedge funds. And I think it is definitely um, very important to pay attention to data analytics and it's a crucial part to any workflow, but especially in asset management workflow. So today we're having four amazing panelists that are going to help us understand how data analytics and AI tools can be used for uh, embedding ASG into processes uh, with asset managers. And um, we are having Tony from Turnkey Group we are having Jason from Mealtech. These are two amazing startups that are based in Hong Kong and they're uh, working closely with ESG analytics and how companies can use ESG analytics for their workflow and processes. And also we have Gabriel from BNP Paribas and we have Bill from CIA Association. And I think this is going to be a very insightful talk today. And first of all, I would like to talk about what are the use cases of ESG data and I think we're very fortunate today to have four different perspectives. And I would like to start with Bill. Uh, Bill is based in Boston and thanks a lot for joining us this evening for you. And um, please uh, tell us a little bit about CAIA because this is our partner organization for this webinar and we're definitely very grateful for you guys to be able to join and co-host this event. And um, please provide your insights on the use cases of ESG data and how they're being used uh, by asset managers. Over to you, Bill. Uh, thanks, Anastasia, and, uh, and thanks for inviting us. And uh, Kai Association is thrilled to partner with the FinTech Association of Hong Kong. And in many ways, very like-minded missions. We're trying to find common platform to bring discovery, enlightenment, and greater transparency, full stop. And you're doing it in the FinTech space. We're primarily doing it in the alternative investment space, but we just launched a new credential called FDP, Financial Data Professional trying to figure out just what the hell we're going to do with all of this old data. And I think it's a good news, bad news situation in that there's so much of it that's out there. And I think that can lead to better discovery, but we got to figure out how we're going to harness it. And I think to your question a moment ago, we did a survey of allocators around the world with KPMG and AMA uh, just the early part of this year. So this data is not that old. And one of the questions we asked the allocators, and these are sophisticated allocators, uh, a public pension plans, sovereign wealth funds, endowments and foundations, we asked them their views about how much greenwashing was in play for their ESG mandates. And the results were very, very interesting. Zero, none came back with the answer, there's none of it in play. 11% said some greenwashing, 41% said significant, and 48% said they're not sure. And what I found most remarkable about that is the 48% that says they're not sure when we have, by most estimates, somewhere between 20 and $30 trillion of assets being managed under some form of an ESG mandate. So we still have a lot of work to do here. I think when it comes to ESG, both the measurement and the disclosure are problematic. 
And I'm a big believer that this wealth of all data is going to give us better solutions that are going to be outside looking in, i.e. management's not driving the decision-making process. We can gather this data independently. And, and there are a lot of smarter minds on this panel on this subject uh, than myself this evening, and I look forward to learning a lot more on it. But again, I uh, very much appreciate the opportunity and the partnership. Thanks a lot, Bill, for your perspective. And uh, definitely asset managers and institutional investors are the key players uh, in this industry. And uh, a bank's perspective would be very interesting uh, for us to hear. Gabriel, please share with us your view on the use cases of ESG data analytics. Gabriel, you're on mute. Um, there we go. Um, <laughs> so, there's a huge range of different ways that um, ESG data and analytics can be used both within a bank and both within an asset management business. From the asset management side, what we find is that, as Bill rightly mentioned, there's been an explosion in ESG funds and ESG data. And one of the key problems is around greenwashing, around representation of what a fund's objective is. And this has been a huge target from regulators globally. Um, in the EU, they're probably going the most aggressive on this in terms of classification and requirements. But what we're really seeing is the mainstreaming of ESG. So if we go back 10, 15 years, ESG was a lot more niche and a lot more targeted on value-based investing. So essentially, are your investments aligned with your own ethical opinions and views? And so this was typically excluding certain sectors. And the data you need to support that isn't very sophisticated. You just need to know whether a company sells alcohol, whether they sell tobacco, or whether they run their casino. That's pretty easy to find out. If we fast forward to today, the growth that we've seen has actually been the mainstreaming of ESG. And so this is becoming used by a lot more different types of investment strategies. So this can be hedge funds trying to find an edge on the um, risk profile or opportunity profile of a company. It can be long-term investors trying to really dig into the corporate governance structure, related party transactions, government fines, environmental breaches, related party transactions, all these sorts of information. And to untangle that web can be incredibly complex and require some pretty sophisticated tools and analytics in order to do it. Um, and so we've got some people on the panel that can go into that side in a lot more detail than I can. Um, but at BMP Paribas Asset Management, what we really try and do is to use ESG data to provide better insight into how a company is operating with a view that better information can lead to better decision making. And the final use case for it is around the problem of how do you represent your funds and what do you actually do with them? And we're seeing requirements from regulators. Uh, this is going to kick in in Europe next year, which will make it mandatory for asset managers to report on a range of metrics, even if they want, if they want to make any statements about their funds being green or sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing a huge growth in the demand for this type of data to be able to accurately represent how funds perform. And so this comes to both different types of data, different use cases and different ways that it's being used by the industry. So there's a huge range of different options out there and a lot of people are struggling to find what the best solution is. Thanks, Gabriel. And I like your point that you mentioned that it comes from the regulators and a lot, I guess, in Europe is happening. And I think um, Jason from Miltat will be able to tell us more about the China perspective, actually, because in China, it does definitely come from the regulators and from the government and the EU space within the asset management um, industry is actually led by the government. And please, Jason, uh, share your view about, um, I know that you guys work with mutual funds and private equity firms, what's happening in, in that space over there in, in mainland China and what's your view on that? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks a lot, Anastasia and uh, Jane, for hosting this session, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I think Bill and uh, uh, Gabriel already, you know, illustrated uh, a lot of the industry use cases. Uh, so we're Mutech, we're a data and technology provider that empowers uh, so financial institutions, uh, corporates, and regulators on green finance and ESG. So I can speak probably a little bit about uh, our client use cases. So from our perspective, there are five, uh, five major use cases that we have seen. Um, for example, uh, first one would be you know, generating return, uh, you know, namely using our 
data for investment strategy. And of, of course, in a finance uh, arena, there's also, you know, in, uh, uh, compared to return, there's also risk. So a lot of the uh, either buy side or, or sell side actually uses our data to uh, analyze, um, for example, their risk exposure according to uh, ESG. And uh, there's also a third category, which I call, for example, regulatory and compliance requirements. I think um, what Gabriel actually mentioned was, um, you know, in, in Europe, for example, SFDR was the um, regulation or European taxonomy that's going to come into the place that mandates all funds to, uh, or asset managers to report their ESG uh, exposures. And, uh, you know, similarly, there are regulations in China as well, um, where, for example, just recently uh, in July, the Banking and, uh, Banking and Insurance Commission just mandated that starting from uh, January 1st next year, uh, all the banks needs to uh, incorporate green finance uh, criteria uh, and 80% um, of these criteria needs to be, needs to be quantitative. So uh, there are a lot of things happening on the regulatory side as well. Uh, so that the funds needs to comply uh, or asset managers or, or financial institutions need to uh, comply. At the same time, for example, there are also fund mandates. Some of the LPs mandated that their money uh, be used on certain kind of uh, uh, criteria or by certain rules. So this is the third category, uh, regulatory compliance and fund mandate. We've also seen uh, customers who primarily want to uh, use ESG for branding purposes, um, where, you know, by incorporating ESG standards, they would attract, for example, more retail customers um, who care about ESG. And um, this is just an example. And the fifth category is actually for a competitive analysis, uh, where we've seen a lot of, uh, for example, either funds who want to see, you know, who, uh, where the money is, uh, you know, the, the capital is flown into, uh, or, uh, for example, on the corporate size, they want to know uh, where the best performers are uh, so that they can benchmark themselves or monitor their, their peers or, or competitors in the industry. Um, so there are a lot of different use cases in the industry, um, but I think in general, these five different use cases are the, uh, you know, majority of what we have seen in the industry, uh, especially from the three different sectors, you know, from uh, financial institutions uh, from corporates and regulators and governments that uh, all three sectors that we serve. Thanks. Jason, and definitely I think the institutional investment side uh, is very important, but also it's interesting to see the company's perspective as well. And I know Tony from Trunky Group works very closely with companies that have to do analytics about their own workload, their own processes. Um, Tony, please share something about the use cases uh, that you came across and you guys have been uh, working with closely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity today. Um, so from our perspective, Turkey, we've been working for some years now uh, in the financial sector with institutional investors, private equity, uh, banking community, really around uh, helping companies to harmonize the complexity around ESG data. So I think a lot of the panel have really addressed a, an important issue, which is uh, I think there's a huge appetite for ESG and that's grown significantly in recent years. But the challenge that we're seeing from a company's side is the complexity around the journey, if you like, in, in terms of which, what's the right direction for me to take? What's the right framework? What's the right methodology? Uh, there's a vast amount of data and opportunity out there, but which is the right direction for me to take? So we've been working, uh, you know, very strongly with companies to try and use ESG data in what we describe as a real-time basis. So in many ways, try quite closely mapping the way that financial data would be, would be managed in an organization. So taking data from traditionally annual reporting into at least quarterly reporting and evaluating a lot of the operational and um, key strategic benefits of ESG into organizations. So working a lot with private equity, what we've seen is that there is an appetite to try and improve the way the portfolio and, and corporates are, are performing um, with a view to actually looking at valuation uh, through ESG for the first time. So if we can start to look at um, key performance indicators such as the reduction of carbon emission, the reduction of cost in, in the use of energy, how does that actually amount to a, to a bottom line benefit? And how does that actually help an organization at the point of potentially 
a trade, sell, an IPO, or looking at shareholder value or consumer value in the business uh, to grow to grow the overall perspective and value of, of an organization. So we're taking it at, at quite a granular level. And we've had some good experiences of, of, of benefits from this. We've recently been working with a company in Indonesia that just been, that's just been bought by, by Kimberly Clark, where the whole process around ESG, the whole KPI structure around ESG was a very prevalent factor in, in the overall purchase of that organization and, and held it a, a huge amount of value. And we've been working with those organizations for three years through a journey map where they started with practically no ESG knowledge through to the measurement of you know 10 to 12 different KPIs around environmental aspects on a monthly basis. So actually measuring trends on a monthly or quarterly basis, reporting to the board, reporting to their investors, reporting to their stakeholders about the actual performance, using those data sets to incorporate strategic benefits such as retrofitting of factories because of uh, high levels of, of emission from, from less efficient operations, looking at even things in the social impact side such as staff turnover rates, training uh, and, and key aspects such as gender equality related to the stock exchange types of mandates and the, and the frameworks around there. So really expanding the whole ESG footprint um, and helping to use each of those indicators as a means of creating value into the business. So where we think we we start to see improvement is uh, we'd like to think that we're seeing more and more depth of data from companies who are starting to really follow uh, much more granular information so that they can see this as an operational benefit and from investors perspectives using that data uh, to incorporate value uh, and potential upside at uh, key milestones during the course of that journey. Thank you Tony and I think definitely what you mentioned about the uh, indicators that are key to and uh, for the analysis of ESG data uh, is very important and the next question that I would like to ask you uh, guys about what is the sort of um, struggle in the uh, ratings industry. So I, I think MSCI is definitely the most well-known uh, ESG uh, rating. And um, I think uh, firstly, I guess, Jason, would you like to give your perspective on how it's being maintained, how it's being constructed? And essentially, is it important to have a universal uh, ESG ranking for all geographies? Or maybe it's better to have just one uh, or many different ones specific to e geographies. What, what is your view on that? Thanks, Anastasia. That's a very good question. First of all, I have uh, lots and lots of respect for MSCI. Uh, they've been in the industry for a very long time. And, um, but before I talk about the details about you know, global versus local and uh, rating, uh, I want to share one perspective, very, very important kind of philosophical perspective. Um, people compare and especially in the finance industry. And that's why, you know, uh, that, that's kind of the core of the MSCI business where um, they provide benchmarks. Uh, and also that's part of the reason why ratings business are in this world because people want to get a simplified signal out of uh, myriads of signals that would uh, come out, right, uh, from the data points that we've been talking about. So that goes back to the purpose of rating and indices. So I think uh, MSCI has done a great job, um, you know, uh, putting all different benchmarks together so that people can compare and know where they are in the industry. Uh, however, having said that, um, right now, um, I want to use a quote from one of our largest customers, a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, you know, when we talked to them, they, they actually said that um, ESG to us is anything other than financial statements. Um, that's the scope of ESG that we're talking about. And that goes back to, um, you know, to uh, not only hundreds, but uh, thousands of indicators that would um, substantially uh, differentiate, I mean, uh, be different uh, in each one of the geographies. And let me give you some uh, realistic examples. For example, uh, in MSCI's rating methodology or many of the others, um, uh, you know, rating methodologies, uh, for example, in Europe and in, uh, in North America, state ownership, it's not a big thing. But when it comes to greater China, you have to think about the state ownership. And there are different tiers of state, state ownership, the central government, the local government, provincial government, and state government. Right? Uh, there, there are so many different ways of uh, state ownership. For example, let me give you another example. 
this year, um, you know, the, the, the Chinese government uh, really is pushing forward a universal pro uh, program to all corporates. It's called Poverty Elimination Program, where they have to uh, either donate or, or uh, devote some of their corporate efforts to poverty elimination in China. And this is something that, you know, the global players have never seen before. And I'm not only, you know, picking out uh, specific indicators in China, but you know, as we are looking into Southeast Asia, we're looking into other parts of East Asia, and we're looking into, for example, some Middle East and Europe, uh, each of the geographies have and will have, it will continue to have their distinct and the unique factors that are gonna contribute to the overall goodness of um, their ESG performance. So to me, honestly speaking, I think a universal standard will never work, but a universal benchmark will always be there. So how to convert different standards uh, and different data points into a simpli simplified signal like the triple A, triple C, and you know, double B's ratings, um, it's really both art and science. Thanks a lot, Jason. Um, definitely, it's interesting to see how uh, you just mentioned that China uh, would regulate how the companies there actually contribute to poverty um, and solving that problem within China. It would be interesting to see if the whole globalization actually brings us to having different companies from different countries actually contributing to solving those problems in other regions and connecting and uniting our world in, from that perspective. Um, and another um, a very interesting indicator that I came across, and I, I'm pretty sure most of you know it, it's EcoBodies, and I know that Tony has a good view and understanding of that, uh, that you perhaps can share with us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I totally agree with, with Jason that the, the rating structures um, have been extremely valuable in putting together some of the, you know, key performance indicators and some of the structure around helping companies move in, in the right direction. Uh, and EcoVirus, we know well from our experiences working with them uh, on, on their structures. They, they have a, a, a very powerful uh, uh, set of companies who they've been measuring for, for quite a considerable amount of time. Uh, very much around uh, ratings uh, related to the full ESG disclosure, including including ESG procurement. Uh, and from where we sort of are collaborative as EcoBodis is creating a rating for a company. Um, and from that point, some of the organizations that we work with are, are looking for assistance to understand from the risk that's generated from EcoBodis or other types of, of ratings uh, agencies, how do we actually overcome some of the issues that have been identified and, and how do we move forward with this? So uh, our role is really to help uh, assist companies to look at the risk mitigation strategies, use data to showcase how they're actually improving over the course of that rating so that when the next rating comes along, be it six months or 12 months from now, there's clearly identifiable uh, elements on the business that showcase that improvements have been made from the rating structure. And I think that's a, a very important element. And again, going back to Bill's comment is how do we ensure that we're getting data in there that's actually not showcasing any, uh, any greenwashing. So how do you actually ensure that that information can be backed up, audited and structured in a way that the, the ratings agencies feel more comfortable moving you in the next direction, moving you to the next level of, of their rating. So, so Ecovitis, we've been working with them, as I say, with some of the uh, private equity firms and institutional investors. Uh, they've been doing a great job in, in helping to put the framework and the identification of, of risk and, and process in place. And I think turnkey supporting in the execution part of that with, with our KPI structures. Thank you, Tony. And um, also, I would like to ask Gabrielle from the BNP perspective. I know the BNP asset managers um, are coming up with their own uh, rankings and their own ESG benchmarks. And while it's definitely helpful to have uh, MSCI and Equivitis as a standard, but it's definitely very interesting to see how banks do it themselves. Um, so, Gabrielle, please provide some of your view on that. 
Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting question and a difficult, difficult question, partly, partly because, as, 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 as we're talking about, there can be a lot of different stuff, styles of use of and, 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 and what I'm saying is that you can get different rates of rating agencies on the top to actually address these different use cases. Um, so, um, so, so some different rates of use cases are going to say social response assessments, where they take account of different metrics that are rated by the funders that have funded the funders of risks and how they're building the funding. There's also, there's also different, different approaches, approaches like the same thing, it's absolutely not seen all of these different things, but when you're waiting, waiting, waiting result, the result, 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 and that's why it's very different, is that if you can just have some rate of rating, so the correlation between rate of rating agencies, rate of scores, rate of scores, they're around 999, so there's almost no difference in how rating agencies, credit credit rates, and rate of rating companies. If we look at the SGSG, it's actually, it's actually a lot of low size. And so and what we actually, actually see is the correlation between the and the top rating agencies and the top rating agencies on the SGSG is around, around 0.4. So, so, so it's, it's almost more scattered at all and it's whether it's strong or weak. And, and from my perspective, this doesn't tell me how we are the SGSG rating rates in Oregon, but it tells you that there are a lot of different things that aids the treatment of the measure. The extent to which they will lower the extent to which they try to take out the yeah. Gabe, uh, sorry, this is James interrupting. There's a lot of echo coming from you. Uh, it's very difficult to hear you. So can you just check your check your connections or make sure you don't have like a, another speaker on or something where you are? Thanks. Sorry about that. Maybe maybe we'll get back to you because I'd love to hear what you had to say. It was just very uh, hard to hear. Yeah, sorry. Uh, my speaker, but actually, um, I think it's a good perspective of what I've been able to hear is that uh, you guys have implemented that uh, personal ranking of yours that you have used for credit risks analytics. And I think it's definitely very important for asset managers to keep, um, you know, good track of uh, that sort of, um, you know, data analytics, because risk management is definitely one of the areas where ESG analytics is being used the most. Um, and I would like to actually um, follow up with um, another question that is very uh, related to this one is about who sets up standards and actually what kind of benchmarks should we follow and in terms of um, incorporating ES and G into that analysis what do we pay attention to and how do we construct all of the three of them uh, together in the same uh, benchmark so I would like to ask um, I don't know Gabriel did you uh, fix the microphone um, let's try another time. I, I, I only have a headset Yeah, sorry about that. Um, then I guess I'll ask Bill. Um, Bill, I'm sure you have worked with uh, different benchmarks and have evaluated what type of, um, you know, uh, components should come into the evaluation of ESMG. Yeah, it, so maybe I'll touch upon that, Anastasia, and then there was a question in the chat box that's kind of related about what this means in the private equity market. So, so a, a lot of the public data we see around Sustainalytics or MSCI, and I think we've chatted briefly about this, and you look at a correlation, it's about 0.5, which is just shocking, again, where we are, and imagine if bond ratings only correlated 50% of the time, we'd have anarchy on our, on our hands, but we still accept this. And I think part of the, the challenge is that ESG is a risk. And if your holding period is gonna be one day or one week, you mostly don't have to worry about it because it's gonna take a longer period of time for these ESG uh, risks to show up in your valuation. So I think what's interesting is the private equity side because it allows for a much longer holding period, which is not nirvana per se, but it, I think it allows you an opportunity to think about these risks over a much longer period of time. And certainly in the US, and, and Gabriel alluded to this a moment ago, the regulators play a tremendous role. And I think because of the overhang of regulation, many companies in the US are staying private longer or they're not even going public at all. And there's so much capital in terms of invested capital and dry powder in the private equity space, it has become the new home for capital formation. So as I think about the smart uh, wizards, the GPs in the private equity side, getting access to this all data 
with more patient capital. I think we're gonna find a better solution there, but I will point out that, that COVID exposed a lot of our investment proclivities and it showed how short-term oriented we were. And this may not be true of every uh, GP, but we saw many, many examples where the GP playbook was draw down your credit lines, furlough your employees, move all your vendors out the net, one, net 60, stop paying your uh, landlord, and let's see if we can muddle through. And then everybody in the US, uh, certainly, and maybe parts of the world, go running for the, to the sovereign for help, as if it's the sovereign's responsibility to fix this. So I think all of us have to take a stand here. And I, I think the patient capital in the private equity space, along with a lot of the ingenuity around what it means to have a green brand, which I think is going to be brand enhancing for these firms, I think that's going to be very, very powerful. So I look to the private equity space to maybe try to rinse out some of the problems I see more in the public equity space. And maybe just quickly, the last point I'll make is that we have an election coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, and I assume that many of you folks on the line know that. And we have a regulatory regime right now with the Department of Labor and the SEC, which almost seem to be blatantly anti-ESG. And there's this concept of a, a pecuniary benefits, and they've gutted the concept of a double bottom line, which is going to chase more and more of these outcomes from an investor standpoint into the private market. So many reasons why I think we've got to be looking over there as well. Thank you, Bill. And I think definitely it's interesting to look at the data as well uh, when we do the um, uh, analytics and we evaluate different data sources and different data types. And I would like to ask um, Jason from Neotech to give us um, his view on what type of data should be used for data analytics in terms of ESG, uh, because we have different media perspective, up incoming data from the news, and then at the same time, we have CSR reports that coming from companies, which is more of a post-event uh, driven data. Um, what are the differences? What's better to use? Um, please share. Sure. Um, first of all, you, you're, the, the two questions that you asked um, to Bill and to me are Actually, uh, I think they're, they're uh, related to each other. So as a data provider, um, you know, we have seen the majority of our clients, especially the top tier clients, having their own initiative to build their own standards uh, within the company. Because eventually, remember what I said, uh, you know, people, when it comes to uh, the, the, uh, the data world, uh, and uh, especially in terms of uh, factors that would generate return, a lot of the fund managers, they would have their own methodologies and their own philosoph uh, philosophies and their own experience accumulated over the past few decades. Um, so that's something that we really respect uh, uh, on our client side. And talking about the data categories, I can help you uh, categorize some of the data, you know, from our perspective, how we perceive data, especially from a technology, uh, how technology will process them and from the data source perspective. So uh, we have four different categories of data. The first category is what we call company disclosures. Um, com company disclosures are uh, not only from, let's say, annual reports, half annual uh, or a quarterly reports, but also that includes CSR reports and, for example, significant event disclosures, uh, their company website, and also, for example, uh, even states SEC have certain, you know, places where a company would disclose their suppliers, for example. Um, so these are, uh, these are the sets of information that are, uh, that are disclosed by the company themselves. And if you put different categories on a spectrum, which I'm going to talk about, they're on one extreme, which is, uh, on one hand, very infrequent. So they only get reported, let's say, quarterly at most. Uh, and uh, also, but on the other hand, uh, the credibility is very high because uh, you know, the companies are responsible for what they say. Right? And uh, on the other um, side of the, the spectrum, the other extreme are, for example, uh, news and social media. Uh, we cover hundreds of news channels and we also cover the Chinese equivalent of Twitter and, in Greater China, which is Weibo. Um, if you think from uh, the pr uh, spectrum perspective that I just mentioned, in terms of frequency, they're very high frequency. Uh, you can receive hundreds of um, 
you know, data uh, pieces of uh, news related to one company in a single day, right? But in terms of credibility, it goes down a little bit. Uh, and in, for example, when it comes to technology, uh, one thing that we face a lot is that um, not only do we need to do NLP, natural language processing to extract the entities, do, do the entity recognition, and do the topic extraction, but also we need to spend uh, a lot of uh, our internal tech resources on, uh, for example, dedupe, getting rid of uh, duplicate news, uh, although they're just paraphrasing each other. Uh, <laughs> And also, for example, you know, verifying whether a piece of news is, uh, is fake or, or true, right? And uh, somewhere in the middle is the third category, is what we call alternative data uh, from uh, websites, especially from uh, industry websites, uh, regulators, and some of the third-party agencies. <clears throat> for example, there are places not only in China, but also in uh, other part jurisdictions uh, to publish uh, for example, environmental penalty data, uh, whether a company has been fined for a specific amount because of their violation on the environment principles. And also, for example, there are uh, product quality inspection bureaus or third-party agencies that inspect, for example, retail products and uh, report their quality. Uh, there are also, <clears throat> for example, uh, websites or um, let's say, uh, industry-wide websites, especially, for example, in the auto industry, uh, there are places where uh, different automakers would go to and disclose or exchange information about their uh, uh, raw material sourcing or, you know, suppliers' information. Uh, so these are all the important resources in the third category um, to help us extract data uh, about, for example, about supply chain, about, for example, from job uh, posting websites, about uh, employee satisfaction, about uh, job discrimination. And uh, we also needed to do a lot of uh, NLP and um, natural language processing to recognize which company it is talking about and what topic it is talking about and being able to extract all the information and the structure in a, in a very structured way for, uh, and present it to our customers. And the fourth category, the first three categories are the categories um, which from economic kind of perspective is what I call microeconomics or micro ESG uh, on a company level. There's also a fourth category which I you know, perceive in our, in, in our view is more like a macroeconomic high level uh, kind of ESG data. For example, uh, especially when it comes to physical risk and uh, climate change um, and uh, deforestation, for example, we have uh, satellite imagery uh, that measures, for example, this past summer, uh, there was uh, lots of flood in China. Uh, we helped the governments to measure you know, the, the uh, flood uh, situation in China and uh, see, for example, the plantation, whether they have been uh, affected. Um, other than satellite imagery, there's also kind of macroeconomic data about, um, about, for example, power generation in the uh, solar panels, uh, from solar panels and uh, from windmills, for example. These are all very good indicators uh, on a national state level or, um, you know, to help uh, different agencies to monitor uh, not only climate change, but also some of the other key factors from a macroeconomic perspective. Thank you, Jason. Um, definitely very uh, good perspective on different data types. And I think that would be um, a good flow to actually give you a chance to introduce Miotech in more details. Um, and then we'll uh, follow with Tony's presentation about Turnkey Group. Um, and then we'll come back to all of your questions in the chat. Um, and definitely thank you guys for sending them and we'll get back to you on them uh, at the end of the, the call. So Jason, please um, share your screen if you have any slides to show, and uh, we're looking forward to discovering more about Neotech and the technology that you guys uh, have introduced into the ESG space. Sure. Um, I think is, instead of uh, talking specifically about um, data and uh, technology, I probably will take a step back and uh, speaking from a high level about why we are doing ESG. And I, I think that question is important uh, for everyone to understand uh, why we think ESG is gonna be a big thing in the future. Um, so I think Greta Thunberg has made her name known to the world. Uh, so everyone knows her, uh, but a lot of people probably also don't know there are 
a lot of KOLs in Greater China, for example, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg has 4.1 million followers on Facebook last time I checked and 2.9 likes on Twitter. Uh, but to give you um, a, a, a gist of how the impact of uh, ESG or climate topics in China, this KOL, I won't name her, but uh, she, she's been popular on YouTube even. So if you look at the, all the followers that she has on some of the key social media platforms, uh, so basically this KOL called Li Ziqi, who's been selling different uh, kind of environmental friendly products and uh, has um, you know, presented to the not only uh, Chinese audience, but the world that uh, you, know, you can live in a very environmental friendly life. She has more than if I were to combine them together, which is an incorrect way because some of the followers overlap. Uh, if I were to combine all these together, there are 77 million followers. Uh, she has 77, uh, 77 million followers on social network. Just that tells you the, the, the scale of the impact and the, the, the trend, especially with the younger generation. And uh, for example, some of the TikTok topics, um, the first one, if I were to translate it, it means my green life, three point or f almost 4 billion views. Second one is uh, um, you know, garbage collection, uh, uh, 3.5 billion or, or recycle. The third, uh, the third one is environmental protection, uh, 1.75 billion. And the last one is protecting the planet, uh, more than 16 million views. And this comes to something really important that I want to share with you. I think we're in a once in a century, uh, a lot of the you know, great investors call a great paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift is shifting financial standards and valuation standards. Um, so I think the Gen Z's social value, especially uh, the younger generation, when I talk to a lot of the, 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 the college kind of a fresh grads uh, friends that I have, they even refuse to use a plastic bottle to drink water. Um, so I think the Gen Z's social value is eventually going to become the mainstream social value that, as they grow up. And then it's going to propel the industry to have a new set of financial value. And that's why we're doing ESG, or doing environmental, social, and governance. Because uh, essentially, we're, we think of it as a new financial valuation framework, uh, which is aligned with the future, uh, especially the future, how the, uh, where the future generation is thinking about. Um, when we talk about value, uh, you know, it's driven by passion. But when we talk about valuation uh, in finance, it has to be driven by data. Um, but traditional financial valuation, as everyone knows, mostly focuses on the financials. Um, but right now, the concept is that financial value is not only shareholder value uh, in your, for example, in your balance sheet or income statement, um, but it's also a reflection of your social value. I just put a piece of news on the right-hand side, which says that um, I think Jeff Basil said that um, you know, shareholder value is no longer the uh, main objective of uh, corporates, but rather uh, social value is. And the problem comes down to how to measure social value. We all know how to measure shareholder value because there are equations, there are uh, accounting standards, but social value is something new. So traditional data sets are based on financial reports but when it comes down to social value, we have to rely on alternative data. As I said, um, there are different sets of alternative data. I've already shared that there are, you know, from our uh, view, there are four different categories, uh, three being micro ESG and uh, one being the macroeconomic ESG data uh, category. And uh, they all different, take different forms. The one I listed here is a piece of news, um, but we also process, for example, we could just go down a little bit, satellite imagery. Um, so there are a lot of different forms of data. How do I process it? Uh, so at Miotech, when, you know, when we talk about technology, we're really thinking about how to transform data to uh, intelligence. And um, we think data and intelligence are different, uh, especially when you think about how to deliver frequent, objective, accurate, and comprehensive data. Uh, data could be one piece of, uh, one piece of uh, you know, data that you gathered from, let's say, 
documents, websites, databases, even from like the images that um, you know I've just shared with you. But it's not information because you need to make sense of the data so that it's a piece of information that informs you. Uh, for example, you know, after we gather the data, we need to use natural language processing to do feature engineering, uh, to do text mining, to simply, you know, put it in simple words. For example, at least you need to recognize which entity you're talking about, this piece of news is talking about, right? And then you need to be able to understand, hey, what the main topic is, is uh, about this article. So what this article is talking about. Uh, so we need to do topic extraction as well. But even if you make sense of one piece of, let's say, article, um, it's a piece of information does not equal to knowledge. Because in our mind, if you think about it, you know, Jason is a friend to um, Anastasia, and Anastasia is a friend to Jane, and Jason is also a friend to Jane. So it, there's a, a map of information. Uh, and all different pieces of information are interdependent. That's why we have also put everything into a knowledge graph powered by our proprietary uh, in-house uh, graph database so that we can, you know, we not only record piece of the information, but also the connectedness of the information as well. And lastly, if I show a piece of code to some of our investors, uh, uh, some of the investor clients or some of the corporate clients or government clients, they won't even understand what it is talking about. Uh, you have to, after making sense of it, you have to present it in a very visually appealing way so that, for example, you know, uh, investors can spend, you know, a few seconds or a few minutes to make a correct decision. So that's how we perceive the data world uh, when it comes to ESG data, which is very alternative, uh, very unstructured, and right now still uh, not very mainstream, but we think there are going to be. Um, you know, some of the things I talked about, NLP, Knowledge Graph, the data platform, um, are the key kind of components internally at Mealtech that empowers our uh, delivery of the, our product to our clients. Uh, just some of the examples, you know, um, they're uh, cell site research that quoted our data on looking for you know ESG proxies in alternative areas. There are also, for example, academic research from, for example, the University of Hong Kong. They've conducted a research using our data that found that uh, employee satisfaction uh, actually uh, uh, is correlated with stock price, and especially do, during the initial outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and uh, they found out that, uh, interestingly, um, companies with higher employee satisfaction, their stock prices are more shock resistant uh, to a pandemic situation. Um, these are some of the examples that we have done over the past for some of the government clients. Uh, we monitored, uh, uh, and also media clients, we monitored uh, coronavirus impact in China. Uh, for example, on your left-hand side, on February 18th and uh, in April, obviously we see a lot more produc production activities uh, just across the border uh, of Hong Kong and Shenzhen. And we also monitored, for example, the flood situation and how that is uh, that affected the plantation uh, in central and uh, central east China. And you know, ratings uh, indices and data dashboard are the things that, you know, uh, from the front end uh, that helps our client understand, remember the intelligence bot um, helping our clients to uh, understand and benchmark immediately. But on the back end, we have a very large database um, that's been, you know, pushed and synchronized with our client database on a daily basis. And that's, um, you know, terabytes of data. And we also uh, offer, uh, for example, news and event monitoring so that on a real-time basis, our clients know what is happening to, for example, a watch list of uh, investment opportunities or to uh, even their portfolio companies uh, that they have already invested in. Uh, so lastly, I want to share that, you know, not, for ESG-based evaluation not involves technology and data but also involves standard setting. I think we touched on that topic. topic. Why are there ratings? Uh, why are there standards? Um, and you know, from my perspective, 
Uh, data is the foundation of everything that we're talking about. Without data, you cannot even, you know, materialize the standard uh, because they, in the end, needs to come down to the numbers. And regulation is something, you know, government uh, or regulators manages. And uh, uh, in the end, it comes down to whether an industry can come up with a set of standards that would govern the overall uh, kind of journey. Uh, some of the regulatory movements, uh, I won't share the details, you know, there are a lot of things happening in uh, greater China. Uh, and, you know, we've also been working with our European clients, um, you know, as Gabriel just mentioned, uh, the EU taxonomy is going to come into place. Uh, and it's a huge opportunity, not only for, uh, you know, ESG, provide, uh, ESG investors, but also for ESG data providers as well. And um, we are in the process of uh, collecting and processing more uh, for example, SI, SFDR reported data. Um, when, it, when it comes to standards, I kind of touch on this as, as, as well, you know, the China challenge. There are also other challenges, for example, we, when we comes to Southeast Asia, there's also what, what I call a palm oil challenge because it's just really hard to collect that information, but uh, people care when it comes to Southeast Asia, people care about the palm oil industry. Uh, so let's take China as an example, you know, state ownership, anti-corruption, uh, poverty elimination. These are all the data points that's been prevalent or they're big things in this part of the world. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, some of the global players haven't been able to address um, uh, or using their, st use their standards to address the uh, key factors in this part of the geography. Um, Employment discrimination is on the other side, uh, hand of, uh, other side of the game. Uh, a lot of our European clients, for example, really care about employment, employment discrimination. However, this piece of data is just not widely available in this part of the world, not only in Milan, China, but also in uh, the, the whole greater China region or in Asia. People just don't quite pay attention to that. How do you generate that set of data? For example, you have to be innovative once, the, for example, the, the regulators don't publish such a sets of data. We have, for example, collected uh, millions of job postings. Uh, one thing that we found out uniquely about uh, the greater China region is that uh, we actually found out that, 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 you know, in terms of digitization of the uh, recruitment industry, um, the, the greater China region is the most advanced in terms of digitized job ads. So we actually collected millions and millions of job ads and uh, analyzed based on our NLP natural language processing algorithm to analyze, for example, their discriminative languages. For example, you want to imagine like Chinese people would post something like, hey, we only hire females uh, under like 30 years old. And uh, <laughs> seriously, and uh, there's like, uh, uh, you know, your height requirement, uh, your weight requirement, uh, these are unimaginable in, in Europe if, uh, if you put it online. But uh, we've seen a lot of these cases, for example, like a, uh, even uh, regional or what we call it like household registration discrimination, like some of the companies would only hire uh, residents, residency discrimination would only hire residents from a certain area. Um, so these are the factors that, you know, um, uh, a lot of our uh, European clients are looking for, but uh, the data, if you think uh, within the box, won't be able to find, but if you think out of the box and by leveraging technology, you will find abundance of data. Um, China, again, needs to have its own ESG standards from what I just have uh, stated, and not only China. When we right now enter into you know, Southeast Asia, uh, even when we were working with European clients, we found out that, you know, even Europe itself is, is different. Um, uh, you know, in, in Southern Europe, um, in France and uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Spain, uh, you know, some of the things are just different from the North, uh, for example, in Norway. Uh, and so each of the geographies, you need to think about the differences. And um, lastly, you know, that's why I'm giving this talk because, um, you know, we position ourselves as a technology provider to work with um, not only data, but internal systems. For example, we build due diligence systems, uh, supply chain management, uh, or data collection systems.
apps for a lot of our clients as well, in addition to our data uh, services. And um, overall, I think there's an ESG ecosystem as compared to you know, ESG players. Uh, you know, I, we have built the data foundation and we aspire to collaborate with the industry to set standards. And we also empower regulators to roll out policies. So lastly, I think the world peace is in our, our hands. That's why ESG is really important. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. And, um, you know, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share, you know, what we think about ESG. Thank you, Jason, uh, for sharing about Miotech. Um, is there any immediate questions from the panelists? Um, I would like to give you guys um, first chance to ask Jason anything you want to find out about Miotech, anything that wasn't as you thought or any curiosity questions that came up. Otherwise, our audience, definitely I encourage you guys to um, participate in the talk as well. I, this is all happening for you essentially. So I, if you would like to learn more about Miotech, please type in your questions um, to Jason. And while we're waiting for them, um, I guess we'll go on to Tony's presentation about Turnkey Group and we'll come back if there are any questions, please type them into the chat. Uh, thank you very much. Can everyone see the screen okay? Yes. Great stuff. Um, so, you know, following on from Jason's great, great uh, presentation, um, how does Turnkey operate in the data space? We're working from the basis of trying to help companies uh, understand how they can actually improve profitability through data and ESG, uh, maximize the capabilities of improving their ratings, and also the valuation of the business, which is really where we see a lot of our focus and attention from investors, institutional investors, and organizations working with us. And really to do that is to ensure that we can capture real-time data, really accurate data, and advise firms uh, on top of that uh, on how they can use this information uh, to enhance their overall ESG practices. And, and, and like uh, Jason mentions, we see this whole ESG program becoming a huge factor in years to come. It's certainly something that's grown very substantially since we started as a company in 2015, and we actually think it's set to grow significantly over the next 10 years. And where, where we try to help is really around the area of harmonization. So um, working with companies who may already have their own strategies in place, but there's a great variety of organizations, some of which are very advanced, some who are just starting on this journey. And the map that they tend to see is um, a lot of different frameworks, a lot of different types of mandatory reporting from stock exchanges and other regulators, uh, a push from some of their investors to improve the value of their business and how to comply with all the regulations in place. And around all of that is, is the data piece, which we think is absolutely critical. But we're starting in many ways with companies who are a little bit confused, a little bit disorientated about the direction and the journey map. And when they start to see the multiple frameworks that are out there, some are from Europe, some are from Asia, uh, requirements from stock exchanges, and, and then individual market sectoral uh, frameworks, there's a great deal of, there can be a lot of confusion as to how to actually drive the right side of data sets and, and, and drive improvement in the business. So Turnkey's working a lot around helping companies with the data, but starting from a materiality perspective, helping them to look at how we can actually drive the right sort of data in the business and then move this journey map from historical data all the way through to predictive data. And, and, and some of those aspects could be science-based targeting, meeting elements around uh, 2030 targets from governmental requirements, and also at the same time, trying to help match that with, with their investors. And on top of that, help to create data that can actually help consumers understand and recognize the value of that company from an ESG perspective. So we're using data to create the transparency to reduce the lack of insight into performance, uh, align the processes around different frameworks and around the different processes that they need to work through and reduce the level of fragmentation that companies might be faced with uh, in the industry today. And we, we see a whole multitude of different problems that have been highlighted with our clients over time. Um, and that is how do we, we're unclear how to define the measurement, we're unclear how to fully incorporate and understand ESG. Um, the reporting burden is high. Um, many companies still think that there could be a negative impact on return. And actually that the ESG process requires a lot of resourcing uh, for a nominal return. 
and also how to get the best out of the data, disclose, and difficulty in increasing value. So around all of these different areas, Turnkey produces this harmonization process and works very much on creating that data set that makes the most relevant sense to both an organization and to an investor and ultimately to the consumer as well. So the model that we work with our data is we're very much working as uh, in the financial element space and working to try and create benefits from all parts of the organization, all parts of the ecosystem. So from corporates, it's creating cost and operational efficiency, using the right KPIs, measuring the right KPIs, using that to improve the valuation opportunities within the business, enhance consumer loyalty so that we can, we can actually use engines to drive consumers to those particular companies, uh, but with very distinct ESG data that highlights and minimizes any greenwashing that's in that particular market sector in that particular company, maximize competitiveness and prepare them for, for the best type of uh, social value, shareholder value that they can get. At the same time, our engine is also very much designed to help uh, investors to look at elements such as risk mitigation. So when we're going into invest in companies and we want them to create the best possible outcome in ESG, how can we make sure that our investments have uh, mitigated our risk? So how do we get transparency to the risk of that business and track, the, and track that risk on an ongoing basis? How do we use that data strategically to drive uh, an optimal value? How do we report uh, to regulators and LPs in the case of private equity and optimize exits? And from the regulators, it's also how to ensure that the companies that we're working with, if we're providing ratings, can provide us with good transparency and compliance data that ensures that we can increase and improve that rating over a prolonged period of time. So from Turnkey's perspective, we work very much on historical data all the way through uh, to predictive data. This is just an example of some of the data sets that some of our companies work with. We're very much, again, driven around different types of frameworks, international frameworks. Uh, so if you're looking at specific stock exchange data, it could be through GRI or other SDG type data, and then um, SASB type data for, for materiality, a multitude of frameworks, and Turnkey's working with about 20 different types of frameworks at the moment um, on, on our platform. And at the same time, also tracking risk from a real-time perspective. So reviewing, understanding the risk, and that can come from ratings outputs where companies are saying, here we have 20 to 30 identifiable risks and how do we address that? How do we mitigate that? And how do we show continual improvement leading to a positive outcome within, within the business? So the benefits of, that we're looking through from a data perspective is to really help all parties to create some of the benefits around profitability. So companies that work with us have to sort of see a, a, a clear roadmap that showcases we can actually become more profitable. We can drive better shareholder value. We can improve the number of consumers and loyalty of our brand uh, through good ESG disclosure. At the same time, we can help to cut costs on the triple bottom line and showcase a competitive edge in our business. We also, at the same time, can mitigate risk, strengthen the reputation of the company, and use ESG to positively grow the business. And a lot of that becomes part of the predictive assessment through digital benchmarking, through um, media incorporation of, of consumer value, bringing more consumers into the business, and through some of the more predictive analysis around science-based targeting and long-term targeting around climate risk and, and um, consumer risk. And at the same time, making sure that we can uh, meet all the compliance regulations that are increasing in every sector uh, around the world. Uh, so I just wanted to put a very high level into this, uh, not, not too much data to show, but uh, to give you an idea about the concepts of where Turnkey is and how we're helping. Uh, to really help organizations, uh, you know, in many ways, demystify the complexity of ESG and drive a positive journey throughout that process you, with data very much at the forefront. Thanks, Tony. Um, it was very good to understand better your business. And um, I would like to have you and Gabriel to um, give their opinion and perhaps have some questions first uh, on Turnkey Group or if you guys thought of any questions. Uh, for Jason as well. Any feedback on what the guys are doing in this industry? Uh, Bill, uh, would you like to start? Sure, I'd love to. And uh, thank you, uh, both Jason and Tony. I was not familiar with either one of those platforms and models, and it gives me great hope for a better future. And I applaud uh, you for the great work you're doing. Yeah, I think that uh, when you hear presentations like this, is, this may be for some of the folks in the audience as well, uh, I think there's a, a worry about uh, what the machine is capable of doing versus what 
the human is capable of doing. And I think, Tony, uh, a word I wrote down as I was listening to you speak was efficiency. And I think all this data and, and processing power allows us to make more informed and more efficient decisions. But it's not going to replace the role of the astute analyst who's going to ask questions. And one of the things we've looked at with this creation of this new credential is that we have many, many data scientists coming into this field that are very good at working with data sets, very good in the STEM-based studies, but they're not trained analysts. And the concept of taking this data and running with it and overfitting the crap out of it and drawing the wrong conclusions can be high unless you have the careful eye of the analyst. So, so I think we've got to find a way of, of working these together. And, and uh, I'm actually uh, next week and we were all sort of stuck in this virtual world. I'm interviewing a mathematician and an author on a very similar subject. And, and he wrote a book called Dark Data, which I was just in the process of reading so I can sound somewhat intelligent when I'm interviewing somebody as learned as, as this fellow David Hand. And he talks about dark data, about the data we don't know. And, and I think we've got to always keep that in mind too, because the data we don't know and can't see, we have to draw some conclusions around that. And recognizing that there's always going to be that blind spot there and thinking about that is going to be an important underpinning too. But, but I'll, I'll finish where I started, which is uh, I really liked both these presentations. And I said, if I think about what the two of you said, Jason and Tony, versus what I mentioned earlier about this disparity between sustainalytics and MSCI, uh, I think we're on to a much better mousetrap here. Thanks, Bill. Um, Gabrielle, um, would you like to give comments on this? Sure, to... let's, let's see if this is working. Um... <laughs> Great. <laughs> Tech issues resolved. Um, so I, I'm actually uh, very familiar with both uh, Turnkey and Leotech and have uh, met with Jason and some of the colleagues over the years um, to dig more into the platform and find more about it. Um, so personally, the, um, the Leotech uh, platform is more aligned with the, what we're looking for as an asset manager in terms of data to supplement our own process and our own practices. And I think that the points that Jason made around country specific data sets are really, really important because people want to be able to compare and benchmark companies. The question I always get is, oh, is my company, my auto manufacturer in China, how do I compare that against my healthcare company in North America? Give me a scale out of 100 and tell me which one's better or worse as a company. And my immediate response is you really can't do that. Like it's, you can create something which will have that scale and it can be helpful from a global benchmarking perspective. But if you want real company specific insight and risk or opportunity assessment, you have to go a lot more granular in order to try and find out what's happening. And from our perspective, the, the type of work that's going on to extract those insights, especially from a lot of alternative data, the government data sets, um, the industry bodies, those sorts of things, they're things that we're trying to incorporate ourselves, but clearly with a small team focused globally, it's very difficult to be on top of every single data set that is available. And then there was one of the questions around integrating alternative data sets from a, a large asset manager, and I can confirm it is a nightmare to try and onboard and integrate one of these data sets. Um, when I speak to my IT team, they tell me it's a three to six month lead time to integrate a data set. And I sit there and say, but I've got the data in the right format from a provider. Can't we just onboard it? And they were like, no, nope, this is the process. This is how it works. And so there are definite restrictions in large entities being nimble in terms of adapting and taking on board this data. And so from our perspective, it's incredibly important to be able to partner with the right data providers who are doing the work that we can actually piggyback on top of. And if we look at the direction of asset managers globally, they're moving away from wanting someone else to tell them the answer as to whether something is good or bad and wanting the raw underlying information so that they can assess it. And as Bill was highlighting, they can do the analytics on top of it. They can make sure that the right level of insight and the right lenses are being applied to it, which is consistent with their own investment framework and process and perspective. So from my perspective, I think that's the direction that's going to continue. Um, my very quick, less comprehensive comments and, uh, and observations on the turnkey product is that I think it's super valuable for a lot of engagement work that is happening within the region. 
So in my prior role as um, head of stewardship in Asia Pacific, I spent a lot of time talking to issuers throughout the region and encountered all of the problems that Tony mentioned. So it was literally around how do I think about this? How do I report? I've got, um, I, I receive a hundred surveys in my inbox every year on different ESG frameworks, which ones actually matter to investors? Where should I spend my time? And then also the big question, is this just a compliance black hole of time and resources that we're shoveling things into? Or will we actually get something out of it? Is there a profit link? Is there a, grow and, and a link to cost efficiency? Is there a link to reputation and growth avenues? So for me, a lot of those elements of the presentation really resonated with um, my experience of engaging with companies in Asia Pacific. That's good. That's great. Thanks, Gabriel. Uh, I think it's a good point that you mentioned that uh, companies are looking for the right answers or they're looking how to find their answers about their own ESG strategy and their own ESG analytics. And I think that's related to the question that we have uh, from the audience uh, for Jason um, about how Miotech's technology is helping businesses and governments achieve China's latest 2060 carbon neutral goal. If that's set as a goal by the government, um, obviously that's important for the companies to be uh, targeting the right uh, KPIs and the right data analytics. Um, Jason, please, would you like to share your opinion on that? Sure. Um, out of the data world, there are really a lot more things that we have been, uh, you, you know, trying to, uh, a lot of the things that we have been trying to solve, uh, the pain points that we have been trying to solve in the industry uh, by using technology. Uh, to give you some uh, vivid examples, uh, Lots and lots of uh, listed corporates are increasingly more uh, interested in knowing, for example, where the ESG funds are investing into. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of public information that's, uh, that's available uh, that we can help our clients gather uh, for listed corporates. And uh, if you look at, for example, one of our clients, uh, their top 10 investors, uh, which has, have been disclosed on the stock exchange, Eight out of ten are members of the UN PRI, the United Nations Principle for Responsible Investment. So lots and lots of the um, more and more of our clients, especially uh, large corporates, are more interested in, in, for example, comparing to their peers, um, you know, monitoring the industry trend and uh, understanding where the ESG funds are investing into because that's going to be uh, the whole trend. Uh, this is one perspective. From another perspective, and lots and lots of uh, listed corporates are also interested, especially uh, when it comes to uh, private and uh, unlisted or primary market, uh, they're interested in, uh, you know, engaging their suppliers. And this is especially important uh, in this part of the geography because uh, you know, data collection, uh, on the ground data collection is nearly impossible after, uh, you know, post pandemic. So having a system that can engage suppliers, that can track the data of their suppliers to allow them to report uh, and allow them to manage the data and report um, so that uh, it's extremely important so that, you know, they can engage with global players as well. We have players in China, we have customers in China, very large uh, manufacturing uh, client, um, you know, who's been engaging with, uh, you know, their, their uh, supply chain all over China, because for example, their European customers uh, want to know, you know whether your materials or uh, whether your fabric uh, or lots of other raw materials are produced under their uh, company ESG guidance or under their company ESG kind of uh, 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 stewardship or, or, or ways that they wanted to, to engage. Um, and uh, they may well lose a contract if they, you know, if their European customers find out that they, you know, there are things that are in their supply chain that are, do not comply with their ESG standards. So this is becoming more and more important for, especially for uh, lots and lots of uh, manufacturing uh, houses in, in, in China. To give you some other examples, you know, we've been also working with some of the government departments on monitoring uh, deforestation, uh, monitoring water usage and water shortage in China. 
Uh, and some of it uh, are also related to, for example, uh, solar energy and uh, also, for example, uh, wind and other kind of uh, clean energy projects. And um, also speaking from the regulators' perspective, they are incentivized to, um, you know, to, to be able to monitor the industry better so that they understand what is uh, happening under the hood. For example, uh, you know, we've been working with some of the government departments on monitoring the uh, sewage and uh, sewage kind of uh, uh, pipelines and also, for example, on some of the, uh, their, the, the listed or unlisted companies on their uh, carbon emission data. Um, so these are also important factors where we have, uh, for example, in addition to our software technology and software technology power, we have installed, for example, IoT devices to help the government track, keep track. And uh, I remember at the beginning, uh, one of the panelists actually mentioned that looking from outs uh, outside in, meaning that you know, the data needs to be objective. And uh, just you know, bear with me, and lots of regulators in this part of the geography that we've been engaged with, they know that uh, some of the company reported that data should not be trusted. And uh, they're working on installing IoT devices to track and verify whether the data is true or not. So these are just some of the examples. And I really think that um, to enable the entire or different uh, industries to uh, be ESG compliant and to bring us a better future, there are a lot more roles that technology can play uh, from different angles. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. And there's actually a follow-up question uh, related to the manufacturing um, activities in China that you just shared. Uh, what are the costs to um, um, implementing a system that shares uh, that type of data? Um, and how do you get around that? Yeah, the costs are actually not high. Um, and uh, you can imagine, and I, I, won't mind, I won't mind telling you that it's not a rocket science project. It's about implementing a system that has a good mechanism that helps you collect data. So, so the cost is not high and feel free to reach out to the uh, FinTech Association or to me personally afterwards. Oh, one example that I also wanted to bring up, I, I forgot to share, you know, we've been also been empowering uh, private agri firms and venture capital firms to uh, implement their due diligence platforms. Because a lot of the increasingly, lots of, lo lots of their LPs uh, have mandated that uh, you know the, the GPs need to do a comprehensive ESG due diligence on any uh, portfolio companies uh, pre or post investment. Um, so we've also built, we've built systems where uh, you know private equity and venture capital firms can do diligence beforehand, asking companies to uh, reply to certain set of information, and also uh, you know before and after pre and post investment. Uh, we can help them monitor from the public space if there are any negative events, uh, especially ESG events are, that are related to the portfolio companies or investment opportunities. Thanks. Thank and, you. And it's definitely related, I think, uh, to risk management and what you know about the mandate uh, of the private equity firms and the virtual uh, venture capital firms. I would like to actually ask um, Gabriel to answer the question from the chat that is related to risk management and regulatory compliance and also alpha generation actually um, from one of our listeners. So thank you for the questions. Um, everyone who has uh, come up with the questions and typed them into the, uh, the chat box. Um, Gabriel, could you please share uh, about the EMP's um, uh, ESG data set and the segments that are related to regulatory compliance, risk management, and alpha generation, and is it difficult to make that distinction uh, for you guys? Yeah, um, for, for us, uh, actually, we don't specifically try and make a distinction or disentangle it. So what, interestingly, a lot of the regulation that is coming up is consistent with commitments that we've actually already publicly made around how we invest and how we monitor and report on what we do. So a, a good example of this is that we believe that through ASG analysis, uh, it can help better identify risk and opportunities in investments and give us a more complete view of what's going on at a company. And so as part of that, we aim to have a requirement for all of our portfolio managers 
to have better ESG scores than their benchmark and lower carbon emission in a footprint than their benchmark. So what it actually means is that when regulatory requirements are coming in next year around reporting firm level disclosure of ESG scores or carbon or some of these other metrics, we're actually already building them into the way that we manage our money and assess um, performance. Um, if we look at risk management and alpha generation, I would argue that you can, they, they can be linked in terms of risk adjusted returns, which is typically what the way that the investment industry thinks about these sorts of things. So if you can generate the same return with lower risk, that's a better outcome. Um, or you can uh, better assess risk within a company in order to drive um, uh, identify mispricing. So a great example of this is that if I'm using data from Jason or Tony and get a better insight in supply chain relationships and risk for a company, but the market thinks that they've got huge environmental challenges and risks, but I know that they're actually doing a heap of work to address it. I could think that the valuation that the market is giving them is not reflecting the quality of the underlying assets and buy the asset. And, and um, once that information becomes more widely known, we would expect a re-rating of that company generating alpha. Um, so again, there's these types of issues which can be used for risk management for alpha generation and also increasingly compliance. Um, but for us, it's part of the same data set. We don't have separate modules of data which are purely for a regulatory perspective that we think are of no value to the investment process. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, and um, I don't know if you would like to also cover the very first question in the chat um, uh, that came, sorry, the very first question that came to you about the example of how you really relate integrate and integrate alternative uh, and real time ESG data into the investment process. I know you said a little bit about that uh, on that. Yeah. It, yes. Uh, very challenging. How has it been for being? Yeah. So real-time data is definitely challenging for us to incorporate and we explored doing some of the NLP and scraping ourselves and um, started running into all of the problems that Jason was highlighting around duplication, different languages, quality of source, and then also importantly signal value. So how do we control for company size and all of these sorts of problems where large companies will have more noise and more information about them, but does that necessarily mean more signal or does it just mean that we're talking about a huge company that's a multinational? And so a lot of those types of challenges that we faced when we were looking at the analysis ourselves, um, we do use real-time data for controversy screening to try and evaluate information as it comes in. And the idea here is to take into account the fact that most of the data that's publicly available is very backward looking and dated. And so, and the other problem is that most data that's available is not numeric. It's for a policy or a program or a commitment that a company has made. And so we need to be careful when we're verifying or trying to calibrate if a company has said they do X, do they actually do it? And so that's where we use some of that real-time data from data providers in order to try and cut through some of those potential issues with data frequency, with data quality and different data types. Um, but it is a challenging area. And I would say that it's a, an area that a lot of people are focusing on. And if we think back to uh, sort of like the earlier comments around ESG becoming more of a mainstream, more of a focus for a lot of managers, increasingly managers want to be able to have a competitive advantage on their quality of their ESG data and the quality of their ESG analysis. And so it's, I, I like to refer to it as almost an ESG arms race at the moment for data where every manager is trying to do everything that they can to try and get a competitive edge. And this can be um, through different sources. Some of the most aggressive uh, players I've seen in this space are actually hedge funds looking to get really real-time satellite imagery, um, IoT connected um, insights in order to actually get better, uh, better um, insight into customer behavior, utilization rates, all of these sorts of things. So um, I think that that's a really interesting angle from ESG. Uh, but for us as an asset manager, we're really just trying to use um, alternative data to calibrate what we currently do and also on more of an ad hoc as opposed to an integrated basis. 
So for example, there's no good data on tailing dams that is available through most data providers, but the Church of England has a good data set on tailing dams and where they currently sit. And it's an important issue for mining companies. Uh, so we'll look at it, but it won't be structurally integrated into the way we evaluate companies. It gets put through more of an ad hoc adjustment to company scores to factor it in. That's a very good point, and uh, thanks a lot for sharing um, the BNP's perspective and the, the bank's perspective on um, implementing this new data. Um, I think we've been very fortunate uh, to have this panel today with all of your perspectives, and I would like to thank all the four of you that were able to join um, today and share about the private equity and mutual funds perspective, about the private companies and public companies that are listed and all of their reporting, what they should do. Uh, in order to implement ESG AI tools uh, to present their data. And um, in, in our workflow, we come um, across a lot of issues when you have to present data to customers, when it's asset managers, and they look at a lot of information at the same time. And as Gabriel just mentioned, uh, it's all about the competitive age and asset managers, hedge funds, especially, they're all um, sort of on the hunt, hunt for advantages and opportunities in the market and definitely Everything that you guys are doing within this space is helpful uh, for capturing that um, accurate data and being able to present that to asset managers and the regulators. And um, I would like to thank also all of our listeners that were able to join today this morning in Hong Kong and maybe evening in other places. And um, stay tuned for our upcoming uh, webinars uh, from the FinTech Association. We'll definitely keep um, researching the space and attracting more uh, speakers uh, such as Tony, Bill and Jason and Gabriel that were able to join us today. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank Special thanks to uh, Kaya for coming in and partnering with us on this. Thank you uh, coming in <clears throat> late, late in the US, Bill. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.